Ми я є прихильником свободи слова. Мені може не подобатись те, що відбувається на програмі, але я віддам життя за те, щоб вона була. From Kiev, welcome to Schuster Life in English. On Monday, November 28th, the former president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, gave his first testimony to Ukrainian court about mass killings that occurred downtown Kiev just before days before he fled to Russia during the revolution 2013-2014, Maidan Revolution of Dignity. He appeared as witness. What does it mean to Ukraine? What does it mean to the world? I am Bat Batison, correspondent foreign policy. In Ukraine, I suppose. Yeah, I'm in Ukraine. Both Aksana Ditinka, defense attorney. Paul Nyland, writer, founder of Statement Mail. Dirk Lasting, journalist, producer, and photographer. Sebastian Gobert, journalist, correspondent for Radio France International, Liberation and uh, Mon Diplomatique. Mm -hmm. So, Oksana, we are not going to go into details, though I must say that the world did not see that interrogation. It was via Skype, it was from Rostov, he was a witness, no one really understood what was happening there. Your impression? Well. From a legal point of view, Yanukovych sure couldn't have been examined as a witness. Because sure, it's impossible in this situation. One person uh, couldn't be both the suspect and the witness. So it's uh, illegal. And uh, the result is that uh, in this trial, in this criminal case, Yanukovych couldn't be suspect anymore. And uh, episodes uh, which are subject matter of this trial uh, sure connected with uh, his charges. Because uh, we all know there are charges against him in organization of this manslaughter on Maidan, uh, in creation criminal band uh, who organized uh, all this uh, manslaughter. So uh, now uh, there are no legal ground uh, to use his testimony and uh, no legal results. So uh, only um, public results, but uh, unfortunately the prosecutor couldn't use uh, this situation to cross-examine him appropriate. So they could use the situation to gain some public uh, support showing Yanukovych's guilt. But, uh, for example, they could uh, show some evidence, some pictures, videos uh, to reconstruct the, reconstruct the situation on Maidan and ask him certain questions about certain facts. But, Oksana, mm -hmm. there were a few very concrete questions. You are right. Yeah. There, are no, there was no cross-examination. But there were a few concrete questions. On February 20th, at, I don't remember exactly, 6.58, you called Minister of Interior. At 7.52, you called the head of the security uh, service. Then again, you called the Interior Minister. And his reply was, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Yes. Does it have any legal weight? I, I, I don't know. I mean, Oksana is the, the, the lawyer here, but what I, what I read was that the reason why they couldn't bring him into this trial, why they couldn't make him a suspect in this particular case, is because it would complicate. What we're actually looking at right now is the trial of five former members of the Berkut riot police. And had they added him as an extra suspect in that case, then that would complicate the existing case that's ongoing. But I don't see why, with the, the evidence that has been taken now in this deposition, in this statement that he's made to court, which was under oath, right? I don't see why uh, we wouldn't good be able to say under oath. Under oath, it must have but been. Wait a second. And under oath where? Yes. In the Russian Federation or in Ukraine? Yes. 
This is uh, also the main problem of this question, of this examination, because uh, only he could be under oath in a Ukrainian court. For example, there are special uh, legal procedures uh, through the legal uh, uh, aid. Uh, he could uh, be examined in Ukrainian embassy, for example, in Russia, mm -hmm. but under Ukrainian jurisdiction. Sure, we understand it's impossible because uh, formally Russia uh, doesn't confirm Yanukovych is in Russia officially. So our prosecution office uh, doesn't have such information. So uh, from this point of view also we have... Uh, so there are no legal uh, responsibility for false uh, testimony of Yanukovych. You understand? So no, no legal meaning. Moreover, uh, the defense of this ex-policeman could use uh, this uh, examination to dissolve uh, legal position of prosecutors in here and uh, some points of indictment. I think it was a big show, this whole thing. So the real question should be, who is benefiting from this show? Because the show started already on Friday, yep. when uh, 10 babushkas uh, prevented uh, the car with the five bear to well, go from Well, don't exaggerate, Cizor it was not 10 babushkas, 20. it was 20, you're not babushkas. Okay, uh, <laughs> you know, when, when uh, on the same week on Monday, you had, uh, at least on paper, 18,000 policemen who was protecting the center of the city, and having been here very long and very active, uh, I know what police can do or cannot do. Uh, I saw how they moved the people uh, in the concert of... of, of uh, but, George, uh, tell me, why? Why do you need a show like that? This is a question to who benefits from it. I think this is the main question because... I don't think it was a show, really. You don't think it was a show? No, I don't think so. Why? I think it was. A, I think he's an easy target. You can get quick political points. I think for mm -hmm. Pravi Sector and the people outside, it was easy points. And I think for Lutsenko inside, it was a show. An easy way to make it look like he's doing something. For, when we look at the legal... Lutsenko, yeah, because he came in halfway through and decided to read out new charges. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Listen, yeah. Ian, yeah. wait a second. Yeah. And you had at least 100 people shot cold blood. That's serious. That yeah. I agree with. Yeah. But... Cold blood, for God's sake. Right. It's at least... A hundred families, relatives, mm -hmm. friends, etc., etc. Uh, how can you make a show out of that? You can make a show out of it because the cases against Yanukovych have been weak. If we look at Interpol, he was taken off the warrant list uh, back in, when did I write down, July 2015, because Ukraine can't provide the evidence. He has a very good legal team. He simply says these charges are politically motivated. And when you have someone like the general prosecutor come into a courtroom for a different trial, someone who had to be appointed by having a law change because he doesn't have a legal degree, and start talking about these charges which don't pertain directly to the case, then it's very easy for him to make that argument and say, look, they're just going after me politically. And Lutsenko is doing that because it's much easier to do that. You know, people look at the pictures and they think, okay, Yanukovych is on trial. That's been the story of the week. They don't look at the details. They see him, he's in a courtroom. And it's probably true that this is the closest he will ever come to a Ukrainian courtroom. But the reality is this isn't his trial. For Lutsenko, though, he can make it look like he's doing something. And that's easier than doing his homework, which is gathering evidence, submitting it, yep. showing a chain of command. Yep. Because it's incredibly hard to connect the actions done by the foot soldiers, riot police, or soldiers anywhere with the commanders. And that's what they don't have right now. And no one wants to do that because that takes time and effort, and that could all be wasted. Everyone wants the quick spectacle. And this is being led by politicians, and Lutsenko is a politician. Can, can I add there, though, uh, that there's an important distinction. What you just said is, is Ukraine can't provide the evidence. What's happened is that Ukraine, and we're talking about Lutsenko now, and we're talking about Shokin before him, the prosecutor generals have not gathered the evidence. They've refused to investigate these cases. And what we're looking at right now, and Savik's so exa exactly right, there are 100 people who were killed in cold blood. And what we're looking at is we're talking about the trial of five ex-riot police. There is video footage showing scores of guys running around on Bankova on Bankova, outside the presidential administration. And these guys are not ex berkut they're ex-Alpha SBU, the security service of Ukraine, or they're somebody else. We don't know exactly who, but these are snipers with, with very, very personalized weaponry. And I think that actually it is possible to gather the evidence the fact is just that we haven't done it yet, right? I don't disagree. Uh, there is evidence out there and you can have it, but it hasn't been presented and it hasn't mm -hmm. stood up in any sort of, not just an international court, but even just to Interpol. Not gathered. 
yeah. so far. And so the big question is resisted. why that's happening. But I think for me, the bigger issue is this issue of chain of command, because you have that with war crimes. You know, the issue isn't yeah. criticizing the individual soldier. We want the person who gave the orders, the political leader. Same thing here. It's a domestic issue. But do you want a couple of riot police, or do you want the people who are guiding them and telling them what to do? Yeah. And I think it's unfortunate that in this situation, when Yanukovych is brought in, he is able to just say, oh, I don't remember that. I don't remember this. Check that with someone else. And it just kind of goes by. And I think that's the really hard thing. You know, some people were arguing this week that this was a cathartic moment for Ukraine. But I think it's disappointing for a lot of people. You know, you had mothers of people who are killed trying to ask questions, get answers, and nothing is delivered. And there's no accountability for Maidan, none whatsoever. True. Yeah, but that, that also falls into the, in, in, in the line of, you know, the, the trials of dictators, like any kind of trials of dicta dictators, like being the Ceausescu or Mubarak in Egypt, it's always disappointing. People never get the answers that they look, uh, the, they're looking for, the, the, they're waiting for. So I mean, it was obvious that Yanukovych would, would use that for some kind of a PR stand. Lutsenko did his job. I mean, he did what he had to do. But it was, the whole thing was a farce. It was a joke. We have absolutely nothing to, to, to expect from that. But yeah, I, I mean, he, it was a PR opportunity for Yanukovych to talk about his uh, version of um, events and to you know, talk about what he couldn't remember. He, he also couldn't remember meeting Surkov. The aide to Vladimir Putin. He couldn't remember speaking to Vladimir Putin by telephone twice on the day of the 20th. These are things that he denied that he could remember. But, mm -hmm. but maybe again, the, the, the lawyer should ask the question: Has not the testimony that he just gave given grounds for further charges to be laid against him? I mean, he, he's made certain statements. Can we then expand upon that? Sure, sure. This is the, the main question. So all this testimony couldn't be used in any trial, especially uh, in trial against him. So uh, it's uh, only the possibility to check some uh, facts. But uh, the one more question is the um, lack of professionalism of our prosecutors, unfortunately. Because uh, despite of uh, uh, wrong legal procedure, they can use uh, some approach uh, to check some facts and uh, to provide maybe some uh, opinion to the public because they knew it was in public. What do you so think only the, from yeah. this point What do you view. think the top thing is they should have done? I mean, is there one thing that you think, oh, they needed to do that, that would have been useful? So uh, I think it would be useful uh, to remind uh, for everybody what had happened. They mm -hmm. have uh, imagined, so have to show pictures, videos, and uh, to remind what had happened. People were killed in uh, really cold blood, and uh, they could create something like a trap for Yanukovych. So, mm -hmm. uh, so there are some uh, approach of cross-examination. How can they use indirect question and uh, mm -hmm. to create Oksana, uh, but, not so... But a witness is a witness. Sure. A suspect is a suspect. He's a witness. Sure. So what questions can you ask? Because the only responsibility before the court he is carrying, that if he is telling false, then we don't know under which jurisdiction he is yes. going to be judged afterwards. Yes, sure. But you know, that's the only thing the witness, he's not responsible for anything else. He can say, I don't remember. Yes, and actually, you prove that it's impossible. Yes, but uh, it's possible to prove. It's possible to prove. Uh, and that he remembers. Uh, he, he, yes, he, he can answer as he likes, because there are no rules uh, which could force a person to tell something. And uh, the main question is the, their responsibility for false testimony. So mm -hmm. if he knew that uh, the result could be, for example, uh, in the future, so he can uh, provide another question. But in this situation, in this legal procedure, which is not prescribed in any, any law, so he, sure he could say. But we all know that uh, he, he, his testimony are false, so it's obvious, yes. it's not the uh, controversial fact. You said at the moment uh, that uh, prosecutors are, are, are weak. Uh, I'm not so sure. I think uh, there might be very big professionals and they, professionals might, want to, uh, uh, they might want to do those mistakes those amateur mistakes. So uh, again, I'm coming back to my, my uh, calling this whole stuff uh, uh, a show, a disgraceful show. I think that Yanukovych answers were disgraceful 
even more and was an insult to the victim and to the people who died on, on, on Maidan. Mm -hmm. uh, but why would they want to make mistakes? I mean, why would they want to do that? What's the advantage to them? Because I don't have that faith in them. I've seen them make a lot of mistakes and I tend to believe they're real. Do, do, my, my question is, do, does someone from the power really want to clarify very clearly the line in command, uh, who was responsible, who gave which orders? I, I'm not so sure that the people in power today, whatever you call them, most probably starting with the prosecutor general, really want to, to totally openly uh, explain what has happened. I mean, three years... Do you think they're afraid for themselves that if there's accountability, it could be used against them? Again, we, we come back to this discussion we always have that I call uh, the problem of the system. In mm -hmm. the system, you have the, the fact that everybody knows something about someone mm -hmm. and everybody owes something to someone. Mm -hmm. So when you see who are the current actors, whether it's Lutsenko or, or, or Poroshenko, they didn't start their career uh, after the 20th of February, right? So uh, there was for sure this uh, trip uh, to go uh, from, from Poroshenko and Klitschko to go and see Fiertas in, in Vienna, and, and no one will well, ever know you're going far away. I, I yeah. agree with you, this, so it's not exactly the context. I'm telling you, if Yanukovych says all the shots were fired, from buildings that were controlled by Maidan. He said that. He said that. Now, is there any proof that it's not the case? Has anyone from those buildings or whoever controlled those buildings <laughs> at that time has been called to court? Has it ever been public? Has it been as public as Yanukovych's testimony? I, I think if you, if you look at the video evidence of what happened on the 20th, and I just mentioned uh, one video where, where it was shot on the corner of Vancouver and Institutskaya, and, and, and we, we saw those guys, and then there's, there's other footage which is from the other side, which is, which is further down Institutskaya of guys getting taken out and bodies getting dragged down Institutskaya. Yes, if anybody analyzes that video evidence, you'll see that there was nobody who was firing from the protesters' side into the authorities' side. And we'll see that the only people who were, who were going down were, were people on the protesters' side. But how do you not fall into the trap? Because then the argument becomes that that's just a provocation, that you know, they're shooting people to allow other people to move forward and to give them a justification to take farther action. I mean, that's not proof in a legal court. I, I don't disagree with you that you know, there has been all sorts of evidence using photography mm -hmm. and film and trying to put it back together afterwards, mm -hmm. but that's not legal evidence. It hasn't been collected and presented in a legal way. But we, we go back to the point that we just made a moment ago, though, that the evidence hasn't been collected. The, but we're, the, it's the, three years later. I mean, yeah. when are you going to do that? I, you know, well, it's it harder and harder. It was never published because I remember the days after Maidan yeah. on, on Institutska, there was a lot of ballistic experts. And uh, I learned now from, from my trips to Donbass that you can quite clearly say from where what is, is landing and flying. So mm -hmm. those people, they were calculating. I mean, they were not just the bullets and the bodies of these poor people. But there were bullets that touched trees, that touched uh, the, the lamps, uh, the lamps yeah. and, and there were this, I saw, uh, there was a lot of, of, of experts who was uh, putting powder and everything, mm -hmm. checking. So, so I never saw the result of this, but I, I'm sure this research was done. <clears throat> But I mean, in, in my opinion, it looks to me that we will never get the answers to these questions. Like, for there's, there's also a very simple reason is that the investigation was kind of twisted, was kind of messed up from the very beginning. I mean, I remember these reports in the, uh, the in, in the course of 2015, uh, 14, saying that uh, basically the the Ministry of Interior under the leadership of uh, Arsen Avakov like was not running the investigation properly, and that quite many evidence were not uh, treated with, you know, the the, the care that, that they should have done. But I think, like, from, 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 from this, like, the, all the, this collecting of evidence and use of evidence, uh, we, we cannot really deal with it in the, from a legal perspective. Like, I think the, the political dimension of uh, this, uh, this Yanukovych being, being on trial, being on, being on the screen, is actually much more important because, I mean, he said, like, there were these... Uh, these guys who were shooting from uh, these buildings held, held by the protesters. But he also said, everyone knows that. And this is going really to talk to quite a large share of the population who actually believes in an alternative uh, narrative of Maidan. And now we are three years after Maidan, and this is very, very much a disaster in terms of, you know, 
this uh, this kind of uh, collective memory and what we can uh, what we can what we can you are absolutely right that. sebastian because it's tr it's true everybody not everybody i mean ukraine is divided in understanding and imagining the narrative now, and the court doesn't clear anything up yeah. and we are even more confused than we were before to tell you the truth after this testimony i never expected the prosecutor to be so unprepared no, not one fact, mm -hmm. nothing, except for those phone calls. And we don't know the content of them. Though I think it's also possible to trace, don't you think so? Because if you tell the interior minister to do something, then follows a command from the interior minister. Mm -hmm. So you know whom to ask. Yep. I, I, don't think, I don't think that people are confused in Ukraine, and certainly those of us, looking at Dirk, who, who were on Maidan that day and throughout, right, and, and, and very closely uh, felt what happened there, and it was very personal for, for many of us. It took, me, it took me a long, long time before I could walk into Tutskaya again. It still upsets me to this day when I, when I walk through that street. And, and I think there are many of us who will simply not forget and will not give up and it doesn't matter how long it takes and it, it's, it's the families of those hundred people that died as well that will continue to put pressure but I, I think I mean you talk about the lack of preparation of the the prosecutor there's there's a, a very clear example of how the former prosecutor together with I believe Poroshenko as well deliberately manipulated evidence that actually had been collected and I, I wrote an article about this which um, I, I, I was furious when I read it, and it was in it was in February of this year after the former economy minister Ivor Sabramovich uh, resigned. Within 48 hours, because they needed to change the, the the story that was that was developing around that and what Ivor said at the time when he resigned, all of a sudden some weapons that had been used during the shootings on the 20th of February had been found. Right, and when we look at the photographs that were presented then in February of these you know weapons cache. They were, they were dug up in a particular spot and there was sand on the ground and leaves on the trees. So clearly those weapons had actually been found in the summer. Absolutely. They'd been found sometime before Absolutely. and they'd been sat on. And the, the announcement of this revelation of this evidence being found was the head of the SBU and Shokin and Poroshenko, the three of them sitting there together, where they, they tried to insult the intelligence of the country and say, look what we've got, whereas it, it doesn't pass the first examination. But this is, I mean, the status quo for me in Ukraine. Without a lot being done, without the economy getting better quickly and all of that, it's all about these short moments to change the conversation, bringing something yep. else in to distract it, to, you know, put blame on someone else. And that's why I refer to Yanukovych as a punching bag, because everyone can get behind hating him. No one likes him at this point, and it's easy that way. What I think is challenging is to go from the moments you're talking about, you know, these little stunts, these bringing in bits of information without conclusion, to something larger like justice. And I don't know how you get to to justice in Ukraine because all prosecution is politically motivated. You know, you have so much breaking of the law that to have anything done, there has to be political will for it. And what we're talking about is how there hasn't been the political will to bring people to justice responsible for the killings on Maidan. And I think that is what shocks and disgusts everyone yep. because why is that? Why is it three years later that nothing is being done? It boggles the mind because you're, you know, naming streets after the Heavenly Hundred. You're saying these people are great. I went to Serhi and Goyan's home village. I saw his school turned into a museum, his old classroom for that. And so you're saying these people are heroes, but you're not actually caring about what killed them, what yep, resulted in absolutely. this. And yep. that's the great, the great tragedy, because I don't think you can do, not do that and move forward. And I don't think you can have closure. I and mean, that was the big thing, me watching this. You have Yanukovych who appears in court and he basically looks like a ghost, right? He's distant, he's hard to hear, no one can touch him, no one can hurt him, no one can judge him. And this is all people have to work with. And just the fact that how ludicrous it is three years later that you can have a conversation with your president who is chased out of the country, who everyone here would say is a criminal. Uh, and there are all these issues, story after story, about the excessive corruption, about the abuse of power, mm -hmm. and there's no accountability. And I think that is the larger issue, because when you have Trump in the US and you have other people, uh, what model is there of being able to bring people accountable for business interests or their actions? I don't think there is much of one at this point. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I believe that actually bringing Yanukovych to, uh, to court well, through video conference on Monday, it was also a way uh, definitely not to get 
justice or an attempt to get justice, but it was also a way to divert people from the, the real, uh, I mean, the real way to get some kind of justice. It is the, the recovery of assets. I mean, it's obvious that we're not going to, uh, to bring anyone really responsible for the 24th uh, of, of, of February massacres. But assets, I think in the past year, I read they recovered $2,500, which means they probably spent much more trying to get assets back than they actually managed to get from people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, th this year, uh, there was the, the, the vice uh, minister of justice just a few days ago saying that the target for 2016 was to recover $308 million from these stolen assets, and they got $7,000. For now. That's a bit of a shortfall. Yeah. A little bit, yeah. yeah. And but I mean, and just that when you look at the campaigns, this is what shocks me. You know, the people trying to keep their assets, they have YouTube campaigns, they're hiring Western law firms, they're much more, they're just better at it than the Ukrainian authorities. And you can say, okay, there's sabotage from the inside, that might be true. There are people who are saying deals have been cut to let them keep things in return for, sure. for turning over other resources. I don't know if that's true. That's certainly the way the game is played, the system is played. But it looks bad, and it's hard to give people something to believe in, because one of the, you know, the fundamental parts, the bedrock of democracy, is some belief in justice on some level, Rule of and law. you don't have that right now. We will break for a couple of minutes. So, Viktor Yanukovych's testimony. What is very curious, according to me, I don't know, you will tell I'm right or wrong, but during his interrogation, via video link from Rostov, Prosecutor General Yuri Lutsenko accused witness Viktor Yanukovych of being suspect in state treason. On this day, the 28th of November 2016, I informed that you, Yanukovych Viktor Fedorovich, are suspected of treason against the state, aiding and abetting the representatives of Russian authorities with the aim of changing Ukraine's borders, violating Ukraine's constitution and unleashing a war of aggression. Yanukovych Viktor Fedorovich is suspected of committing treason against the state of the 1st of March 2014, when he, the citizen of Ukraine, was at the unidentified location at the territory of Russian Federation. He acted deliberately and violated Articles 1, 2, 65, 68, 132, 133 and 134 of Ukrainian Constitution. Realizing that his actions were illegal, he submitted a request to the President Vladimir Putin to use Russian armed forces at the territory of Ukraine. His actions ended up with dire consequences such as violating of sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. In particular, his actions have led to occupation of Crimea and loss of state property worth of 1.08 trillion hryvnias. It's strange, at least awkward, I would say, that during the interrogation of Yanukovych as a witness, all of a sudden he is transformed into suspect. Well, uh, I'm sure that Attorney General provide a legal procedure of uh, serving with notice of suspect, because he, uh, he claimed uh, that this notice of suspect in treason were served uh, according to the criminal process. So it means if uh, there are no poss possibility to serve this notice uh, in person, so uh, it could be sent uh, to the last uh, residence or within uh, defense. So it's not the problem. So. I think Attorney General just used this situation uh, to announce these charges uh, oh, in public. Oh, he had never our possibility to tell him? Yeah. Well. <laughs> sure, he, he, he can't. Just he, in this situation, <laughs> when Yanukovych <laughs> is in international search, uh, he, uh, prosecutors only could uh, send this notice uh, to the last uh, residence. That's all. So I think it's more um, public action, but... Uh, from legal point of view, it's not so problem because we know there are a couple of charges, uh, seven or eight charges, uh, where Yanukovych is suspected, and they all are investigated now. So uh, it's not uh, the question that uh, this uh, notice uh, was announced in this trial. But Oksana, Ukrainian people may have doubts about what happened in Maidan and who was really shooting and who gave orders. But they have no doubts about Yanukovych, who asked 
Russian Federation to bring troops in. Mm -hmm. No, that, that nobody has doubts about it. Sure. Established fact. Established fact. So why do you have to do it on the day of his testimony? So I think it's just exactly what Ian said earlier on. It was the Lutsenko show. It was, it was the prosecutor general standing up and saying, look at me, I'm doing my job. It's low-lying fruit. I mean, he, he, low -lying he, fruit. he's a politician who is now the general prosecutor, and he will go back into politics. Also, you can argue that law in Ukraine has always been political. So, I mean, this is an easy opportunity for him to be seen with them. And again, I think the most important thing is the visual language. When you, you know, boil it down to headlines and what gets put up on the internet, you know, it is trial Yanukovych treason. And that is the dots he wants people to put together. And then it seems like he did a lot more work than he actually has. And we are, we are now three years of the beginning of the revolution of dignity, so perfect timing. You know, there are always some cyclists when, when news appear, like uh, uh, we just spoke about the arms that they discovered in summer and then showed uh, in February. Yeah. The, the same with, with, with now. It's, they have to show that they do something. So, perfect platform. But I'll, I'll say, though, that the, the first time that I called Yanukovych out for treason, I remember the date. It was the 21st of November 2013. It was the day after the revolution started. And, and in response to what he'd just done, by, by backtracking out of a, 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 an agreement that had been negotiated for yes. over a decade and that had been his platform that, that the country had expected. Like, we all knew that this was coming. And I, I said at the time, you know, that he backed out of that. I thought that was treasonous. What makes that treasonous? Uh, well, isn't the definition of treason that you're doing something that is the, a deliberate detriment to your country, that you're doing it deliberate harm? Deliberately no? betraying your country. Bet del betraying your country, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. because yeah, I can I see a treason if you're that. talking about Crimea and military intervention. I mean, in terms of agreement, if you're doing something that's not great for the country, that's probably harder to argue. But, I mean, do you know what, what is treason in Ukraine? What does it so come down to? Treason, according to criminal law, treason yeah. is a deliberate action uh, against territorial integrity made by um, a power official. So uh, it's also uh, one more uh, important thing that uh, this person must have power, so must uh, have take a, a legal position, or power because position. With yes, that so. definition, I mean, the focus is really on Crimea, then. That's the issue with the territorial integrity Cry so far. Crimea and also the invitation for Russian troops to enter into eastern Ukraine, which is exactly what, what Lutsenko did with the low hanging fruit that, that, that he grabbed, just like you said. But there is also something else in that. I mean, in accusing a specific person of uh, state treason, then you actually, uh, uh, how to say, uh, you, you don't blame the system that was working under this person for it. And then now that we are in the process of, uh, you know, reforming the state institutions, reforming the, the courts and so on and so on, then in a way to have like someone who is the bad guy and the responsible, then it means that, yeah, the other ones may actually stay put and may actually stay in, uh, in, in office. And I, I do believe, from what I understand from Lutsenko's game in the general uh, uh, pro prosecutor's office, this is something that he's interested in. Like, not to actually get rid of the former system, but to work with it. But, I mean, this is, for me, this is the big thing with him. With Yanukovych, he gets to look like the good guy. He gets to be on the side of good. He gets to do something that everyone agrees with. People can say, oh, there's not content to it. Oh, it's not this. But no one has an issue with him going after Yanukovych and criticizing him. There are other moments when he doesn't get to do that. The conflict with Nabu with the anti-corruption office was embarrassing. There are other issues he has to take which are embarrassing. So those moments where he can be uncontroversially the good guy, he needs those. Because especially, this is the point for me, if you're going to have a political career, if you're not going to disappear into legal details, you need those moments. Because when it comes down to the resume and when you're running to something else, that is what's going to get shown. That's the little B-roll of your career, of him going after Yanukovych on film. And it's people aren't going to remember. It's, you know, that nothing came of it isn't going to matter. And they're just going to say, you know, well, Russia won't release him. Russia won't give him back to us. Russia won't do this. When the reality is he's not on the wanted list to begin with because they haven't been able to get that together. Yeah. But on the other hand, you say, and you rightly say, it's very difficult to try a dictator. But Yanukovych... I even believe it's counterproductive. No, but, I, you know, do you really feel that he was a dictator by the time that he was ousted? Yes. Yeah. 
What do we I call? Was, what do we call? Sorry, I know I you was, want to answer. I was, I was what are the 16th of January laws called? I was, I was generally law. referring to dictators across the world, but yeah, in, in my in my understanding, Yanukovych was more of an authoritarian leader, but he didn't cross the step to dictatorship. At least that's not what I what I saw the, under Maidan in my on on the time of Maidan. So 16th of January. The dictatorship laws, that's what they were called. Tim Snyder, the, the yeah, professor from Yale. Laws, laws, said, that, laws that were actually not implemented. Oh, they tried to implement oh. them. That's, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> that was why Khrushchevska were kicked off on the 19th. It was the, the next Sunday. That. You, you remember, remember it? We all remember it. I, yeah. yeah, but we have a lot of political in a bus, leaders right? who would like to be dictators who never get to that point. I'm mean, surely part of being a dictator is having that power to do those abuses. If you have checks and balances or can shut it down, then you're not in a dictatorship. The only, the only check and balance at that time was the, was the people of Ukraine who went on to Khrushchevska and, and yeah, you know, spent, spent of... six days then from the 19th until the, the 25th securing uh, a, a, an agreement from the, the Yanukovych regime that those laws, which were illegally passed in the first, in the first place, would be, would be scrapped. I was for sure he tried to become a dictator. Yeah. He was asked that question during interrogation. And he said, well, they voted. It is a parliament. And I had to sign it. It, it was... <laughs> President can veto any, any law, right? To sure. start with, yeah. and I, I think that, uh, again, uh, we shouldn't even let the discussion come up on, on how bad he was a, of, of a dictator or, or not. Yeah, I mean, when, he, when you listen to his uh, explanation that he wanted a peaceful solution uh, for, for Maidan, there were enough defended. moments that showed that there were no peaceful solutions searched for, either on the night of 30th of November, 11th of December, the 22nd yeah. of January. And now I'll ask you a question. And I think that many people listen to his answer. If three foreign ministers of the European Union, French, German, Polish, Polish, Polish sign an agreement, mm -hmm. and you have early presidential elections, yep. you have a change of the entire system, etc., he signed it, opposition leaders signed it. Mm -hmm. Why didn't it get? Why didn't the European leaders insist that it would be implemented? Because Yanukovych ran away that night. That, that deal was that deal was signed on the 21st, and that was that was the night that he left. And the reason why he left is because he already knew that Parliament was going to gather to try and impeach him. He knew he, he, there, there were phone calls that were going from members of the party of regions to members of the then opposition, including people that I know, uh, people that were members of Parliament at the time. Uh, and and they, they were being told, the party of regions guys were saying, that's it, after what he did yesterday, we now need, we, this, this has gone too far, it has to stop. But also at the same time, uh, Yanukovych knew that his own people were turning against him. He knew that his power base was collapsing. But at the same time, he was also packing up measure gear. He started packing up measure gear and sending trucks with all of his loot, all of his valuables out on the 19th of February, the day before everyone got shot, right? I, I think it's the same. I think this is the best deal that he personally could get out at that right moment. Uh, me, but the prosecutor at that kind of interrogation could have asked him, why did you start sending your Packing. personal valuables out of Ukraine on the 19th? And he said that he left only with hand luggage. That's in, that, was not, that was the interview. That was his press conference on oh, Friday. Which he did on the Friday, yep. yeah. Yep. He did not say it in court. He didn't say it in court. You're, because you're he was not asked. But, but if he had have been asked, then we've all seen the footage of those two helicopters that were struggling so, to take so, off so, because, because they were so, so heavy, heavy, right? Mm. Yeah. And, and the foreign affairs minister, with all respect, uh, you see how our friends, the foreign affairs minister, are, are behaving right now in the talks about elections in Donbass, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. For Europe, it was a good deal. Calm down the situation. Until December 2014, a lot of things can happen. So, so, uh, and it gave a, a possibility of, of, of power to the leaders, uh, Yatsenyuk, uh, Klitschko, and Yanabok. So it, it, it looked on, on, on paper a deal that everybody could maybe live with. And thanks to our friend uh, Volodymyr Parasyuk, well, sure, yeah. uh, who until today, I say, changed Ukrainian history. You might think about him what you want, but I think that he changed history when he said, no, the yeah. people of Ukraine, too much death, too much blood. No, no, no. But of course, diplomats always try to, that's their job. 
find deals. Well, so, diplomats yeah. want to moderate, right? Diplomats aren't enforcers. They're not there. They can't make people do something. They have small tools. This is the criticism, whether it's Minsk or something else. And they just wanted an agreement that both sides would agree on, and then they could kind of continue that way. But if one side starts to go away, and there was a big New York Times piece looking at the preparation that was published on this, then that they can enforce it. And you have issues, too. You can't have foreign powers coming in and enforcing an agreement uh, on a country between a leader and the people, and that there's no legitimacy to that. Well, I mean, there was also an issue that, that the Western diplomats actually did not understand the situation on Maidan. I mean, this is something mm -hmm. that we saw all throughout the, the, the period of the revolution, and I remember that just a few days after Yanukovych had fled and he was uh, impeached by the, the, the parliament, there was uh, the French foreign minister, Laurent Fabius, who was still insisting that the agreement would be implemented. Mm -hmm. So that shows that they were kind of blind on this, uh, on this issue. So I think Yanukovych also played a lot with that during the negotiations, well, and one, it really bought him a lot of time. I mean, the agreement was a mess, right? Because then later, in terms of propaganda, you had Russia trying but to use the it. Europeans, Russia had it never signed stability. up to it. I'm sorry? For the Europeans, it was stability. And stability... It's a good European for solution. For German and French diplomats, it's sure. really the most no, important no, it thing. It's not a great European solution. No, but it's what they like. As it turned out. No, it didn't work out well. But it's bringing people together. You sign some documents, and you think everyone agrees. That, that's the easy, standard thing. The problem is that doesn't work when you have a popular uprising and you have people out on the streets. It's the same question we, are, we have discussed a few programs ago, Bob, about elections in Donbass. It's more or less exactly that. OK, let's say elections in Donbass. Yeah, great. Elections is a good word. Uh, reforms, elections, etc., etc. Exactly what happened there. Yeah, but, because... But, but no, that's... I, I don't think... You know, he used it in court as an argument. Yeah? Is it an argument that has to be listened? Is it an argument that... Uh, you understand this kind of his testimony? I still don't understand why. I don't understand what. I don't understand... When I do. That's the only thing I understand is when. November 28th. The rest, I don't understand, really. What does it tell Ukrainian people? Nothing. Uh, it divides Ukraine even more than it unifies, because there are a lot of people who think the way he thinks, that it was done deliberately to provoke that kind of unconstitutional, quote-unquote, unquote, change of power. Basically, yeah, it's sort of he, he's playing a game and he, prov he divides Ukraine more. And prosecution allows it to happen. But, but I, I, I think most people in Ukraine now do understand. I mean, at, at the time that Maidan was finishing, there was a lot of disinformation that was going on on Russian TV, which was being watched predominantly in Crimea and in mm -hmm. the East. And, and, and that uh, helped lay the foundation for what Russia tried to get away with in the East after that. But I think most people in Ukraine now do actually understand what was going on. I, I, I reread my Facebook memories throw up a, a post from three years ago today, and it was Roman Aliarchuk in the Financial Times. He's, I mean, a, a great guy. He's very knowledgeable about this part of the world. Um, and, and he was talking to the, the closing two paragraphs were a conversation that he had during Maidan with the head of the Independent Coal Miners Union in Donetsk, a very, very powerful group. And that guy said, the people of the Donbass are also fed up of Yanukovych, they're fed up of corruption, they're fed up of this system, and they're not going to stand up to defend him. And that was at a point, the 30th of November 2013. That's, you know, but that's, a different that's thing. the early days yeah. of the revolution. And since then, we know more about what's happened. I don't think the country's But I mean, I've been to Donbass recently. You will still have people who will say that moment when there was violence and there was fighting on Maidan, that was too far and that was them being pushed out. They wouldn't defend Yanukovych, but they still feel that they weren't a part of that process. And those are two different things. You cannot want to defend someone because you think they've been terrible for the country, and mm -hmm. you can still disagree with the way things went. It is still a divisive issue. People still talk about this. Sadly, it's not just in the role of Russian propaganda. Uh, so, I mean, he brings this up. The thing is, Yanukovych will continually bring up these old wounds. He will continue to bring it back. And in, just in terms of psycholo psychology, I think he himself will always be frozen in this moment. He will always be presenting his perspective and the way he saw it and trying to defend it, because he will never be more than this. But I think when we, when we talk about the fighting that was on Maidan, uh, there, there, were, there were two specific times when that uh, step was taken from the protester side. Every other time that, that Dirk mentioned, it was Yanukovych's side started the violence. And one was the reaction to the dictatorship laws. And then the second one, and again, this was something that Yanukovych said either in his testimony or in the press conference, I can't remember which, but he said that he agreed to everything. He agreed to constitutional change. 
And what was supposed to happen on the 18th of February I was think that it was Parliament, a press conference. I Parliament so. was supposed to convene to discuss constitutional change, which Yanukovych had agreed on. And when the bill of uh, order for that day of Parliament was published and there was no constitutional change, that was when people marched on, on Parliament. So the, the times that there were violence and, and, and after Khrushchevskova, I wrote then, I cannot condone this, but I understand why it's happened. And I, and, and I understand why, after three months of protest, why people marched on Parliament on the, on the 18th as well. I, I mean, it's I know why you can understand it, but not, not all Ukrainians do, still. You can still find people who don't. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not that hard. It's a very divisive yep. issue. I, yeah. I think one aspect you should also see, think about, because you say Yanukovych appearing in a trial wanted this, Yanukovych in, trial, in court wanted that. Is it Yanukovych? I, I don't think that this is a, a Yanukovych point. Uh, move. I think Yanukovych did what he was asked to do, and that Yanukovych said what he was supposed to say. Sure. Because I think one of the most embarrassing moments in this court show was when they asked him, what did you do on the, the 20s in the morning? And he takes his paper. Which day you said 20s in the morning? Oh, 20th in the morning, no, I stood I up at 6, you know, then I went to the bathroom. And so, so, so it is embarrassing. I mean, so uh, do we speak about Yanukovych or do we speak about our Russian friends who decide that it's a good moment again to, 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 to a little Throw bit in tickle the in, the, in, the, in the wound and, and, and use Yanukovych uh, for this Rostov Look, court show? I mean, I understand Russians could have decided, the Kremlin, I mean, to use him. But Kremlin did not initiate it. Kremlin never initiated his interrogation. You understand? I understand. The it's Ukrainian exactly side decided that. Now, why? I don't understand. Uh, to me, it's really, I, I, it's a mystery. No, it's incompetence, I must say. Yeah. I must say it's incompetence, maybe it's populism, maybe it's that political kind of, you know... Maybe all of it together. We, we, mm. we don't know who started it from the Ukrainian side, because the Ukrainian side is, is, is whom? It's the judge, it's the prosecutor? You, you think that Ukraine is not infiltrated? I would, I would understand, excuse me, Dirk, I would understand if Russia, for instance, thought of preparing Yanukovych to some kind of Babrak Karmal. You know, you bring him into Kabul, that means to Donetsk, you know, Lugansk, whatever they control at that time, you know, and make him the leader of uh, Donbass. I don't think that even Kremlin is so... so it was one of the early things that was talked about. In the, in the early days of occupation, there was... There was yeah, but it, it really became clear very early that it was that not they possible. Take I mean, it, yeah. Yanukovych exactly. is burned. No one respects him. Absolutely. I, I was in Crimea five days after he's a traitor. He was in Beach. Yeah, he's, he's a traitor. Simple. He's a traitor. Simple. He's a coward. That's even, that's even yeah, worse that's for right. the people. You're right, yeah. He's a coward because he left his country. Yeah. I, I, I really believe that here, I mean, the, the, the figure of Yanukovych is not really important. I mean, the thing is his speech. And actually, as I said before, that it really uh, reactivates a lot of elements that are used in this alternative, parallel, uh, and, and totally paranoid uh, narrative of Maidan, the narrative of the, of the, of the beginning of the, of the war. And this is something that really plays good for some, uh, for some people, for example, the, the opposition bloc and some other political forces, they are really going to use that kind of arguments to uh, strengthen this, uh, this, this idea that something was not so clear on Maidan. And because it's doubt. We have been... I mean, what hidden. you're talking about is doubt, and this is what, you know, Russian propaganda or any propaganda use. So it's, you know, any extent mm -hmm. that he can muddy the waters and say, I don't remember, or maybe it was this, and when that argument isn't challenged, it's out there again, and it's being used again. And that's the danger to it. And for me, again, that's the lack of resolution, because if you can still have that put out without it being knocked down, yeah. you know, he dominated uh, the news cycle for a while. He was able to come out and say what he wanted, get his points again, and everyone was quoting him. He was up and he had videos. And that is a certain amount of power. Now, many people would agree that he is an instrument of Kremlin propaganda. I would agree with that. You can also see that he's become a less useful one with time. He hasn't been wheeled out as much. It was interesting for people, because I think he'd given some of his previous talks in the Rostov in Russian. Now he's switched back to Ukrainian, as he's trying to argue that he's still relevant for Ukraine in some sort of a way. Um, but what he will do in the future is hard to say. For now, though, he just, you know, confuses everything. He mixes everything up and gets people to focus on that for a bit, but without anything being done, because they cannot get him back. I mean, he is there and he is safe as long as he is there. 
I think, I think there is one very uh, clear element to, to judge how much the Russian state system and propaganda actually credits Yanukovych is that for three years he has never been seen with Putin. There was not a single photo of, not a single public appearance and it's not of the two men Moscow. together. Don't you know that Putin doesn't like traitors? <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes there are some useful traitors. <laughs> no, but Oksana, but what I'm, in that position of a prosecution, in what they, the questions they asked, evidence they presented, isn't there something that they're hiding? Isn't there something they want to protect, something not to appear? But I don't know. I mean, I, a lot of people are asking those questions. Well, unfortunately, I think uh, the prosecutors uh, want to, to hide that maybe the lack of evidence, because in this trial, uh, the prosecution uh, must provide uh, all evidence referring to these episodes on 20 February, but without a, a suspect uh, of Yanukovych. So uh, in this trial, we will see uh, which evidence they have, so which uh, forensic evidence, witnesses, so we will see it in the future. But unfortunately, there are only five ex-policemen as suspect here. So it's also a legal problem because uh, uh, if Yanukovych has no right to defense in this case, so uh, it means uh, he could be suspect uh, in these epi episodes in the future. So also it's like legal trap for prosecutors. That's interesting. Yeah. Yes, so I really... It is, Paul. Uh, well, as, as, a, as a witness, he doesn't have right to legal defense. As yes. a suspect, then, then he would have done. Mm -hmm. It uh, would be... Uh, the ground uh, for defense of Yanukovych uh, to blame prosecution and uh, to eliminate any future suspects from but, uh, legal procedure. But what I'm also, saying, Oksana, is that, you know, all of us, we are journalists, we talk to a lot of people and we know a lot of things. We know, at least we hear them. And I talk to a lot of people who have been part of Maidan, a lot of them have been armed in the days already after uh, January 16 or even before. And people tell me different stories. And if I were a prose prosecutor, I would ask a lot of questions, not only on Yanukovych's side. I would ask a lot of questions on this side as well. Because really, there are many more questions than answers. I, th I think if, if you were the prosecutor, if I were the prosecutor, if Dirk was the prosecutor, we'd be actually prosecuting the case. We'd be actually I investigating it and uncovering, up, yeah. uncovering all of the evidence and putting all this together. Three years. Three years. Three years. Three years. Three years. Yes, it's a long time uh, to provide uh, uh, proper investigation. It's a long time. And, it, and it's and not it, just, sorry yes. to interrupt, it's not just about Yanukovych. It, it, it's about, like I said earlier on, the, 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 the images, the footage from the top of Bankova showed a, a, a team of 15 to 20 people. And that's not the guys that, who were the Bear Cook guys who were running around the October Palace. From that high vantage point, Bear Cook, they were firing AK 47s. The, the, the number of armed people on the side of the authorities on the 20th must be something like 40 or 50 as a, as a minimum. Why are there only five guys on trial? There were, on Bankova, again, the, the footage that, that I've got, there are, there are five guys, four standing in one group, and then there's another one who kept going forward and looking. And, and their faces are open. You can see their faces. Why have we not identified who these people are? That cannot be that hard. Because they were standing been, on bank of her on the 20th. But it's been a debacle. I mean, you've had people who've been arrested and they have been released on bail and yeah. they've disappeared. I mean, this yep. has been going on for years. Yep. They're taken into custody, they're released, and they're gone. And no one knows where they are anymore. Meanwhile, you have family members, the people who are killed, bringing evidence that they put together themselves, you know, videos of what happened, objects, other things they've collected to prosecutor, prosecutors for years now. And it's gone nowhere. And there, you know, unfortunately, what we keep coming back to is there isn't a good answer to this. Obviously, there are reasons. Mm -hmm. What they are isn't clear. And you know, the most shocking thing is that this isn't the number one priority and hasn't been. At Sadly. this point, you know, you will have a museum of Maidan, which is great. You have, you know, an Institutska on, you know, for the Heavenly Hundred there. You have permanent monuments that have gone up. But do you want a monument or do you want justice? And it keeps mm -hmm. going for monuments that then politicians, foreign ministers, ambassadors, they can leave flowers in front of them. 
But that is not the bigger issue, and that's not the real issue for a democracy. For a democracy, you want the system to work. You yep. want to have accountability. Mm -hmm. And there, it's not coming any closer to that. And the sad thing is Ukraine can't do that internally. And abroad, when they're dealing with international tribunals, when they're trying to get assets back, it's also not working. And, and what do we keep coming back to? That we, we keep coming back to corruption of the judiciary. How have, how have those people who've been arrested, charged, they've then been released, or they've absconded? It's corruption of the judiciary. It's corruption of mm. the judiciary, but I think you raised also a very important point, is that not that many questions have been asked to the revolutionary side. I mean, I, I remember two, uh, one year ago for the, for the second anniversary of Maidan, I was really spooked to see, in, it was a documentary movie by Babylon 13, to see a guy from Lviv saying on the screen in the, in the documentary how he got himself uh, an, an, uh, an automatic weapon, and he was on the on the on the conservatory, on the terrace of the conservatory, and then he started to shoot at Berkut. And this has never been uh, investigated; it has never been prosecuted. Maybe the guy is lying, maybe he's not. But the thing, I understand the reasons, and as a journalist, uh, I, I supported the ideas of the revolution because democracy, freedom of press, and this uh, this idea of dignity it is extremely important. So I. I have to say that I stood more on the side of the re revolutionaries than on the other side. But still, I mean, there were weapons on Maidan. There were <clears throat> people who actually, you know, shot some policemen. And this has never been investigated. And I mean, this is a problem with the rule of law. This is the problem with, uh, with, uh, with, with this trial, I mean, with this kind of forest that we saw on Monday. But it's also, and I, I keep coming back to it, it's really much a problem when it comes to the memory of Maidan mm -hmm. and to uh, and to the collective the well, collective issue, memory that we have of this the popular, the popular narrative the popular narrative you know what everyone agrees on what everyone knows and then you have the legal proven version so for example even with the shooter you're talking about that film last year was shown on the first channel mm. and you know it was shown it was talked about as like look there are also people shooting from the other side and they're pushing this but that's never been brought into the legal narrative there isn't you know that's challenging that doesn't necessarily ruin anything but you would ask the question when did you start shooting? Why did you yep. start shooting? What was going on? And no one wants to push that. No one wants to go that step. They want that to be in the past without dealing with it. And I think that's dangerous in Ukraine because when you have so much unresolved history going back to the 20s, you know, whether you're talking about famine, whether you're talking about war, and none of that's been addressed. And that's the issue, the criticism when we were talking about the decommunization laws that oh, this will just be forbidden. Let's not talk about these mm -hmm. things, right? And the problem with that is it gives it power. And that's what we're talking about when we talk mm -hmm. about Yenna and others, that if it's left unresolved, if you give it this energy of being something controversial, something mainstream people don't want to talk about, you give it power and you open that up to populists who want to use it. And that's dangerous. Well, friends and colleagues, it's great listening to you, but pleasure always comes to an end. See you next week.